How y'all doing good people? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing to my channel. And while you're at it, smash that like button for me. I really would appreciate it. Also hit that post notification bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. Be careful down in the comment section of the videos. A lot of spam, a lot of scammers. I will never ask you to contact me by WhatsApp or Telegram. I also do not invest money for my subscribers, so please be careful. Don't get yourself scammed. If you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo Moo is gonna give you up to 15 free stocks when you open a new Moomoo Moo brokerage account. They're gonna give you up to 15 free stocks for just trying out their brokerage app. When you put $100 in your Moomoo Moo brokerage account, they're gonna give you five free stocks. When you put $1,000 in your Moomoo brokerage account, they're gonna give you 15 free stocks. There's a link down in the description box of this video. Go click on that Moomoo link. Open up your new Moomoo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. Just to remind you guys, I'm gonna be using the Moomoo brokerage app to double my net worth in the next 10 years. I'm gonna be buying three big boy blue chip paper assets using the Moomoo brokerage app. If you wanna rock with me and copy my plan, you gotta go down to that description box and open up that Moomoo account today. Put some money in it. And then I need you to send me an email and just say, hey Richard, I've opened my Moomoo account. Please send me that wealth transfer blueprint video that outlines the three big boy blue chip paper assets you're going to be buying to double your net worth over the next 10 years. And I will send you that video. Just send me an email. My email address is down in the description box as well. Well, guys, we got a lot to unpack today. And just like the title of the video says, inflation got worse. And on top of that, we got a new tax bill that President Biden is rolling out. It's a huge one. We're gonna go through that one and dissect it and take a look at it as well. But let's start off with inflation. We got the February CPI inflation report on yesterday. And it, it appears inflation for the second month in a row is increasing. Um, if we go back to January of 2024, headline inflation came in at 3.1%, um, and that was year over year. And then month over month, it came in at 0.3%. In February, headline inflation year over year came in at 3.2% and month over month, 0.4%. So two months in a row, we've been hotter than expected. Uh, should that be a concern for us? Um, I, I think it's certainly something that we, we need to keep on the radar. We gotta keep that on the radar and I'm gonna tell you why, because there may be a possibility of the Fed increasing short-term interest rates if inflation doesn't turn itself back around and, and, and they get better data over these next several months. Let me just read you one thing that, that speaks to that point. Um, one of the Federal Reserve governors, her name is Michelle Bowman. Let me read what she said just a few days ago, March 7th. She said this on March 7th. And the reason I want you guys to hear this is because I want you to understand everybody in the Fed doesn't think like the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. Let me read this to you. The US economy is not at a point where the Federal Reserve should reduce interest rates. We know that because the Federal Reserve Chairman has already went on record saying, we're gonna keep interest rates higher for longer because inflation over these last couple of months 
is still a little bit teeter-totter, right? The Fed governor, Michelle Bowman, said on Thursday, and while the baseline remains for falling inflation and eventual rate cuts, tighter monetary policy still can't be ruled out. Now, this is a Fed governor, right? While the current stance of monetary policy appears to be at a restrictive level that will bring inflation down to 2% over time, I remain willing to raise the federal funds rate at a future meeting should the incoming data indicate that progress on inflation has stalled or reversed. This is a Federal Reserve governor. Her name is Michelle Bowman. Bowman said in her remarks to the New Jersey Bankers Group that largely focused on her views about bank regulation and supervision. Bowman also has been among the more hawkish policymakers in her views on inflation and inflation risks, said she did feel the current benchmark policy held at the 5.25 to 5.55 range by the Federal Reserve since July of 2023 seemed to be appropriately calibrated to reduce inflationary pressures. My baseline outlook continues to be that inflation will decline further with the policy rate held steady. Now, all that is saying is, is everybody that's part of the Fed, the Federal Reserve, is not in lockstep. This lady, who's a Fed governor, is not opposed to increasing short-term interest rates. She's not opposed to it, guys. Not opposed to it at all. So you, 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 you got to be aware of that, right? Now, if we go look at the jobs report for January 2024, the economy added 290,000 jobs. Unemployment was 3.7%. Let's fast forward. To February's jobs report. What did it come in at? 275K jobs added to the economy. But what happened? Unemployment went up to 3.9%. So, so you got a Federal Reserve governor going on record being extremely hawkish and saying, listen, if inflation don't come down, I would support increasing short-term interest rates in the near future. That's what she said. Then you look at what's happening in the labor market. The labor market over the last couple of months is starting to decelerate. It's not as red hot, right? Plus, what do you see happening? You start to see unemployment starting to creep up. So you got a Fed governor basically saying she supports rate hikes, <laughs> when we thought rate hikes were over, she said, I support it if we can't get un inflation under control. So part of the Fed, that governing body, the Federal Reserve, some of their members won't rule out rate hikes. And then you see what's happening in our labor market. Our labor market is starting to soften. So is that a concern? Yeah, it's a concern. We definitely got to have that on our radar, right? We definitely got to be paying attention to what's going on with those labor reports in the next few months. And we got to pay attention to what's going on with the CPI inflation reports for the next few months. We really do, guys. Because, yes, the Federal Reserve chairman has went on record stating that their price cuts could be possible in 2024. But, see, we won't get any uh, rate cuts in 2024 unless inflation continues to come down, right? We got to get better data that's continuing to show that inflation is coming down. Why is that important, guys? Because I'm telling you what's happening is things are starting to change and shift. You know, I, I was reading an article where it talked about 
more Americans are yanking money from their 401k plans to pay bills. You're talking about people going to their 401ks, taking money out just to be able to make ends meet. That's, that's not good. Remember, we've talked about over the last several, several weeks, I've been telling you guys, we got two economies here in the United States. We got this boom economy up here and we got this bust economy down here. This article that I'm getting ready to walk you through about Americans taking money prematurely out of their 401ks and retirement accounts just to make ends meet. So we got this boom economy that people, oh, the economy is great. It's doing wonderful. And then we got this economy down here that is not doing so great. Typically, the 1% are in this economy up here at the top, right? They're doing great. They're buying assets. They're, they're selling stock and, and, and getting big profits from it. They're doing all these things. Great economy. They're taking trips. They're buying homes. Down here in this bust economy, people are living paycheck to paycheck, right? People got high interest rate credit card debt. People are taking money prematurely out of their 401ks just to pay for the basic things they need to live. Listen to this. A growing number of cash strapped Americans are cracking their nest egg for emergency funds. So people are going to their 401ks, their retirement funds prematurely, yanking money out so that they can cover basic everyday needs. Let's keep reading. The number of 401k plan participants taking hardship distributions increased by 13% between the second and third quarters of 2023. Now, this is according to analysts at Bank of America of its clients' employee benefit programs. This is coming from, from Bank of America. That figure now stands at 18,040, the highest level in at least the past five quarters since Bank of America started tracking the data. The growing reliance on 401k plans as a source of urgent cash in further evidence of, finan of consumer financial stress heading into 2024. So basically what they're saying here is, guys, people are strapped for cash. They got no personal savings left. Interest rates are so high that they can't borrow money. A lot of people's personal credit scores have deteriorated because we know a lot of Americans are late on loan payments, whether it be auto loan payments, credit card payments, mortgage payments, student loan payments. More and more Americans are starting to be late on payments. So therefore, no, there are no personal savings. They don't have access to cheap money. All people have are their wages. And the wages are not outpacing inflation. So, so your raise that you got from your employer in 23 wasn't enough to keep up with the cost of your goods and services, which is inflation, right? So no one has an emergency fund, basically. So the emergency fund now has become your 401k. That's your emergency fund for a lot of people right now, at least according to this article. Your emergency fund is your 401k. Let's keep reading. Despite high GDP, once again, high GDP, what does that mean? The economy is doing well, but that's the boom economy. See, that's the 1% wealthy of the wealthiest. That's the boom economy. Investors who, who are investing their money to build assets, to generate income, they are having a great growing, booming economy. That's why they say here, despite high GDP, right? low unemployment. Some Americans are clearly facing a cash crunch and struggling to pay bills. Despite a high GDP, and all that means is a booming economy, despite low unemployment, all that means is unemployment is at some of the lowest levels it's been in a lot of years, right? 
Despite all of that, people still are in a cash crunch. Right? Still in a cash crunch. Lisa uh, Morrison, managing director of Bank of America's Retirement Research and Insights Group, said the rising number of 401k hardship distributions could be caused by high inflation and the rising cost of living. See, bingo. See how we go right back to inflation again. That's why I started off with inflation, guys. See, inflation is causing people to do what? Not have enough money to be able to buy the basic things that they need to live. That's why the Federal Reserve's whole mandate is to create price stability in our economy. That's why they want price stability in our economy, because they know most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. About 62% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. About 62% of people of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And with high inflation and the rising cost of living, and all that means is your wages are not keeping up with the cost of your living which is the, the, the goods and services that you got to buy. Remember, we looked at the inflation report in detail yesterday in, in yesterday's live stream, and we talked about some of the areas that had really seen a jump in, 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 in increase in price. Gasoline, month over month, 3.8%. Boop, went up. Shelter costs continued to go up. I think it was 0.4%. Month over month, shelter costs went back up. So what I'm telling you guys is the cost of living continues to increase. It continues to increase, but our wages are not keeping up with that increase, right? Your primary wages are not keeping up with that. And we're starting to see a uptick in unemployment, right? From January to February, from 3.7% in February, I'm, I'm sorry, in January to 3.9% to in February. So we're starting to see a softening in the labor market slightly. And you can tell by jobs added, to, that the economy added, 290,000 jobs in January, 275 in February. Unemployment in January was 3.7%. Unemployment in February is 3.9. You see inflation for the last two months tick up slightly. Those are not good recipes. Not a good recipe, guys. Bad recipe, and we got to be prepared. Why do I tell you guys this? See, some people think I tell you guys just to try to paint some picture of gloom and doom. No, I'm not trying to paint a picture of gloom and doom. I'm just trying to get you to understand what's happening in this economy that you and I are participating in. I'm just trying to get you to be prepared so you know how to plan and, and maneuver and get yourself through this and still get to your wealth. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. A lot of people don't understand why some people say the economy is doing well. And they say to themselves and they look at their situation and say, well, how can they say the economy is doing well when clearly I'm living paycheck to paycheck? Clearly, I'm having a hard time affording the basic things I need to live. Clearly, I'm having to tap into my 401k just to be able to cover some expenses because my paycheck ain't going for enough. So there is a lot of concern, guys. And we're going to talk about some solutions in a minute. But, but, but there are some concerns. I wanted to kind of paint that picture for you. Now, let's look at one other thing. This 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 five point five trillion dollar tax hike that um, good old President Biden getting ready to roll out. Um, let's take a look at that, because I think this is some, some some interesting information that we need to take a look at. So let let me get this article up real quick here and we're going to take a look at it because I think that's some in interesting information. So here it is right here. It says. Biden unveils a massive $7.3 trillion budget with $5.5 trillion in tax hikes. Plans for highest 
burden in U.S. history. <laughs> that don't sound good, do it? That don't sound good at all, especially when you're down here living paycheck to paycheck. You got high interest rate credit card debt. You around here trying to figure out how in the world I'm going to make ends meet. I'm tapping into my 401k, and this guy is getting ready to roll out a $7.3 trillion budget. $7.3 trillion, guys. Crazy. And again, guys, this ain't about picking sides. He's the sitting president. It's his bill. I cover it. Ain't got nothing to do with whether I like him or not or if he's good or bad. I'm just telling you, he's the sitting president, and this is what he's getting ready to roll out in the midst of everything that's going on for the 99 percenters. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just giving you the information so that you know how to make moves in order to get yourself to freedom. That's it. So let's read on here. President Biden unveiled his election year budget pitch Monday, calling for $5.5 trillion in tax increases by raising rates on the wealthy and corporations while spending $7.3 trillion on defense, federal benefit programs, affordable housing, and student debt cancellation, among other proposals. See, you know, here's my problem. Here's my problem. We're in an election year and everybody trying to earn brownie points, right? Everybody want brownie points because we're in an election year. And one of the things that they try to roll out to get brownie points is this whole notion of student debt cancellation. They keep rolling that out. They dangle that carrot in front of people, especially people who got student loan debt. They dangle that carrot in front of them. Oh, oh, yeah, we're going to cancel it. This is a proposal. Guys, it's a proposal. Ain't none of this law yet. This is just a proposal. Right. So so keep that in mind. It's a proposal. He can tell you whatever he want to tell you. The other side can tell you anything they want to tell you. It's all proposals. Nothing has been approved, right? Nothing has been approved. So keep that in mind. Here it is. Fiscal year 2025 budget, which is highly unlikely to be approved by Congress. See what I'm trying to tell y'all? People can propose whatever they want to. You heard exactly what I was just getting ready to say. You can propose whatever you want, but you got to get Congress to buy in on it. And that's where the fight comes in, right? You got to get Congress to support it. So the fiscal year 2025 budget, which is highly unlikely to be approved by Congress, matches last year's top line tax increase level and spends $300 billion more while purportedly cutting the federal deficit by $3 trillion over the next 10 years, the White House said on Monday. Again, guys, the White House can say whatever they want to say. And again, not picking sides. I'm just telling you, as a person living in this country and, and the economy that you're living in, well, a lot of us are living in this bust economy. We're not living in this boom economy. A lot of us are living paycheck to paycheck. You read this and you think, send to yourself, okay, there's some good things, but then there's some bad things. So let's read through it and then we will, I'll give you my take on it once we, once we get through it. Fiscal hawks and Republicans alike were quick to call out the administration for reckless spending. And then the game begins. This is how it works in this country, right? We're in the middle. You got these two parties on each side and, and, and the American people are in the middle and it's a tug of war act. One party is pulling the rope their way. The other party is pulling the rope their way and we're stuck in the middle. We're the rope. We are the rope. You got Republicans over here. You got Democrats over here pulling this in this tug of war and we are the rope. The American people are the rope. Just keep that in mind. You are the rope in this tug of war between these two parties. You are the rope. The Committee for the Responsible Federal Budget noted the Office of Management and Budget estimates project the national debt would surge to $45 trillion by 20. 30, 
for. That's what they're saying the budget is going to soar to, guys. Guess what the budget is today? Um, guess what the, the deficit is today? Guess what the deficit is today? About 31 trillion. That's the deficit today. About 31 trillion. They're saying this thing is going to grow to 45 trillion over the next 10 years. Guys, it, I, I, I'm, I'm fat. I, it, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. The national debt would surge to 45 trillion or 105.6% of gross domestic product. That's a lot, guys. That is a lot. That is insane. The Post on Monday, the Post on Monday that the president's proposal would saddle the U.S. with the highest sustained income tax burden in American history as a share of the economy. Highest sustained income tax burden in American history, guys. I'm just reading it, guys. You guys think of it what you want. The president isn't simply raising taxes to close the deficit. He's raising it to expand government. That's what they're saying about the president. That's what some of his detractors, people on the other side over there, that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. Wow. The president isn't simply raising taxes to close the deficit. He's raising to expand government. The highest peacetime burden in American history. In a Friday interview before the budget dropped. One of his detractors added that the proposal amount to even bigger tax hikes down the road when it comes time to rein in the deficit. The price tag of President Biden's proposed budget is yet another glaring reminder of this administration's mm, 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 appetite for reckless spending and the Democrats' disregard for fiscal responsibility. That's what some of the GOP leaders are saying. Now, of course, they're going to say that. They're on the opposite side, right? You got, you got, you got the Democrats over here for big government you got the Republicans over here for small government. That's basically it. No matter what side you're on, that's sort of the, that's how they go. Democrats, big government, they want to police you. They want to control you. They want to, you know, manipulate you. Over here, you got small government. Hey, you get, you eat what you kill, right? You, you, you go out and make it on your own. Ain't nobody, we ain't giving you nothing. We don't care what's going on in your life. We, we, you, 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 hey, put your big boy pants on and go out there and make it happen. See, that's that's so the, you in the middle again. Remember, tug of war. You're it, it's a tug of war, and the American people are in the middle. While hardworking Americans struggle with crushing inflation and mounting national debt, the president would increase their pain to spend trillions of additional taxpayer dollars to advance his left-wing agenda. That's not me saying that, guys. That's the article. That's what the, the opposite side, that's what the Republicans are saying about this budget proposal. This is what the Republicans are saying. Go out and, 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 and read the article for yourself. I don't want you thinking this is what I think. This is not what I think. If you're just jumping into the chat, this is not what I think. I'm reading an article that was dropped by the Washington Post. And this is what the article is saying. And of course, Biden has his point, but also the Republicans have their point. Right. Also goes on to say Biden, 81 years old, floated some of his budget proposals during Thursday night's State of the Union address including raising the income tax rate for corporations to 28% and bringing the minimum corporate tax rate from 15% to 21%. So here's the deal. 
Biden's whole thing is, I'm going to make the rich pay for it. That's the way, he, that's the way he's going to position this thing. I'm going to make the rich pay for it. Not the, not the 99 percenters. I'm going to make the one percenters pay for this 5.5 trillion in tax hike. At least that's what the proposal is leading to, right? Whether that'll happen or not, I don't know. But, but that's what he's leading to, right? He also called for more than $400 monthly in mortgage rate tax credits and a 25% tax on billionaires defined as those with a net worth of 100 million or greater, right? So he's saying, listen, 99%, we're gonna give you some tax credits towards your mortgage rate. We're gonna give you some tax credits. Listen here, billionaires, we're gonna hit you with a 25% tax. And that's, you guys, over $100 million in net worth. That's what we're gonna do for y'all. We're going to give y'all that. At least that's what the proposal says, but let's keep reading. You know there are 1,000 billionaires in America. I didn't know that. I didn't know there was that many billionaires in America. 1,000 billionaires in America. You know that the average federal tax is for these billionaires. Check this out, guys. This is going to be shocking. At least it was shocking to me. Let me just read that again so I won't miss nothing. You know there are 1,000... Okay, all right, Richard. Can you read... Slow down and, and read it right. You know there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax for these billionaires, they are making great sacrifices. 8.2%. <laughs> That is, that's pitiful, guys. Think about it, guys. That's pitiful. Come on, man. If you're in the lowest tax bracket, if you're a 99 percenter, guys, if you're in the lowest tax bracket, you're paying at least 10 percent. I'm talking about if you're a W-2 person in the lowest tax bracket, you're paying at least 10 percent. This guy, they're saying billionaires on average. I'm talking about billionaires, guys on average, pay 8.2% in, in taxes. <laughs> now, now, some people will say, well, golly, Richard, 8.2% of, you know, 100, billion in 100 million in taxes is more than, still, guys, come on, 8.2%. That's what they're saying. Now, I don't know this for a fact. I'm just telling you what's in the article. Let me read that one more time. You know there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for these billionaires. They are making great sacrifices. 8.2% Biden said, mockingly adding that his tax hike would raise 500 billion over the next 10 years taxing the rich. He's saying these guys are paying 8.2%. That's... <laughs> In proportion now, they're billionaires, but in proportion. Let's take a guy like me. I make a decent living. I make a decent living. And I'm still paying at least 15% in taxes. Now, I own a business, so I get to write off some things that people who are W-2 employees don't. But I still pay about 15% in taxes, guys. These guys pay less than me. And, 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 and they, they're worth 100 times more than me. <laughs> Boy, these billionaires got it made, right? But I keep telling y'all, this tax code is set up for who? Businesses and the wealthy. Our tax code, the way it stands today, is set up for businesses and the ultra wealthy, not the 99% or W-2 employees. W-2 employees and the 99 percenters, we get the worst end of the stick. We get the short end of the stick. And here's what some people will say. Well, you know, uh, the 1% pay more in taxes than the 99%. Well, it make, well, I would hope so because the 1% control 99% of the wealth. They should pay all the taxes. They control all the wealth. Why would the 99% have to pay more than the 1% when the 99% own 1% of the wealth? The 1% owns 99% of the wealth. 
so they should be taxed more. Absolutely. I'm in agreement with that. They should be taxed more. Under my plan, nobody earning less than 400, this is Biden now, this is not Richard Fain, this is Biden. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay an additional penny in federal taxes. That's his plan now. That don't mean it's going to get approved by Congress. His plan is saying if you make under $400,000 a year, you're not going to pay any additional taxes above and beyond what you pay right now. That's what he's saying here. Nobody, no one, and they haven't yet. That's what Biden's saying since he's been in office. That's, that's what he's saying. Let's move on. The White House budget claims revenue from new taxes would help prevent the insolvency of Medicare while paying for a $2,000 cap on prescription drugs and a 35 cap on insulin. So again, the, the, this proposal, and that's all it is, guys, is saying, okay, we're going to help folks. We're going to help the 99%. 99%, y'all ain't going to pay no additional taxes. We're going to make these billionaires pay it. We're going to make the 1% pay it. 99%, we're going to help you out with Medicare, right? We, we're going to give a, we're going we're gonna to put a cap on prescription costs. We're going to put a cap on insulin cost. The Biden administration has repeatedly attacked congressional Republicans for supporting the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act under then-President Trump, which is faulted for including giveaways to the wealthy and corporate tax cheats. There again, guys, you got two parties, like I said, one party is pro-business, pro, business, pro uh, you eat what you kill. That's one party. The other party is pro-government. The other party is depend on us. Lean on us. We're going to help you out. We're going to cap things. We're not going to make you pay no more taxes. Da, 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 da. So who do you believe? What do you, what do you, what do you, who do you believe? Do you believe this people over here? Do you believe those people over there? You in the middle. You're in the middle. You're the rope. You got the Republicans pulling the rope on one side. You got the Democrats pulling the rope on the other side. You're in the middle. You're the rope. They're trying to win you over. It's an election year. They're trying to win you over. See, here's my thing, guys. You better sit down and figure out how to get you to your freedom by yourself. Them Republicans nor those Democrats going to do nothing for you. Everything they're doing is self-interest or whoever put them in office that's who they're trying to help now no doubt there are some good people in both parties who want to help the american people the problem is ain't enough of them it ain't enough of them in both parties that are truly here to help people because if they were they would truly just come together and help people but they don't they don't do that what do they do? They fight over if the wealthy going to pay taxes. I already told you all how I feel. The more money you make, the more assets you have, the more wealthier you are, you should pay a, a, a bigger share of taxes to live in this great country. That's the way I live. That's the way I, I don't mind paying my taxes because I live in the greatest country in the world. And there's a cost associated with living in the greatest country in the world. And I don't mind paying my fair share of taxes if I make more than somebody that makes less than me. I should pay more taxes. That's my responsibility to do that. But that's how I feel, guys. You don't have to feel that way. You feel whatever way you want to feel. But the way I feel is if I'm fortunate enough to, to, to live in this country and I was fortunate enough to get out here and hustle and get mine and, and, and put myself in a position, great. Now, I'm not saying I'm sitting here trying to give it all to the all to take care of everybody, but I'm willing to give my fair share. I don't understand how someone that's makes who, who's a billionaire can pay less taxes than I pay. Percentage wise, not dollar wise, percentage wise. How can someone that's worth 10 billion dollars pay less percentage wise in income taxes than I pay or you pay? You got people out here that are struggling, man. 
You got people out here that are tapping into their 401ks to do what? To be able to cover the basic things they need to live. I don't know, man. Y'all help me out here. I, I, and I know people are passionate about this. And, but, but, but you got to understand, guys, what's happening. You got to understand what's happening. However, most of these tax cuts will sunset by 2025. That means they'll be over. That means they'll be done. Leaving a glaring black hole in the budget. And complicating Biden's pledge to to not raise taxes on Americans earning under 400,000. They're basically saying he's going to have to tax them. He's going to have to tax them. He's going to have to tax the 99% because a lot of these tax cuts, they go away in 2025. Let's take a look at a breakdown of where this, this, this money is going and then we're going to move on, guys. We're going to move on from this. Let's just, here's a breakdown of Biden's budget proposal for the fiscal year 2025. We're going to go through that and then we'll move on. $7.3 trillion in total fiscal year 2025 federal spending up from projected $6.9. $325 billion in paid family and medical leave for 12 weeks for eligible workers. 258 billion investment in affordable housing and up to 10,000 in new tax credits for first time home buyers. So they're trying to, again, guys, trying to incent you to, 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 to get you a piece of that, um, uh, that American apple pie, which is home ownership. That, that's what they're trying to, they're trying to help that process along. Now, y'all know how I feel about home ownership. When you are in the building stage of wealth, y'all know how I feel about that. But let's let's move on. Twenty three billion in climate adaption and climate adaption. I guess that's for the climate. Right. Yeah. And then they're going to also have twenty three. Some of that twenty three billion for interior homeland security, agriculture, a, a whole bunch of other stuff. I ain't going to read all that. 13.6 billion to address the border crisis. I know some of y'all are passionate about that. Biden has some money in his bill to address that. What they're going to do, I don't know, but he got he got 13.6 to address the border crisis, including hiring more than 2000 border officers and more than 1600 asylum officers. So, try to help with you know, this whole border thing. 12.3 billion for Internal Revenue Service. I told y'all yesterday these people getting ready to hire, maybe two days ago I told y'all this, they're getting ready to hire 30,000 IRS agents. 30,000. They're going to spend about 80, 80, I think about, well, they're saying here 12.3 billion. So, but they're going to be hiring a bunch of them. So, so be careful out there, whatever you're doing with your taxes, be careful. They're hiring a bunch of these folks and of course, they're going to come after their the 99 percenters, they're going to come after the one percenters. So just be careful out there with your taxes. They're hiring a lot of agents. Three point three billion for Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, and its fight against drug trafficking. And then we have nine hundred and eighty one million for executive office for immigration review to cut down on backing of more than two point four million immigrant court cases. Back to the immigrants again. And then another $145 million for U.S. citizenship and in immigration services. So a lot of stuff with immigration. Uh, so there you go, guys. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting. It's very interesting, Biden's budget. Again, it's a proposal. Whether it will get approved whether to get through Congress, I doubt it. Not in that form, it won't. It won't get through Congress. We know that. We know there'll be some negotiations and some, some, but again, this is an election year, so let's throw this big old Frisbee out there. Nobody can catch the Frisbee, but let's throw the Frisbee out there. It's an election year. Let's see if we can win some brownie points. Let's see if we can get some people on our side. 
We got a pretty tough opponent that we're going to be going against. Let, let's see if we can get some brownie points. That's what I think it is. It'll never get approved in that proposal. The way it's shaped today, it'll never get approved. You know that. I know that. So just, just understand what's happening here, right? Understand what's happening here. And again, guys, if we talk about what's going on in this labor market real quick, and then we're going to wrap this thing up and, and, and go to a couple of our last topics. Um, when we talk about this labor thing and what's going on in, in, in the jobs market, a total of 84,638 people were laid off from U.S.-based employers in February. Did you know that? Remember I told y'all earlier in the, in, in, in the video that, you know, unemployment is starting to creep up. Federal Reserve believes it'll creep up to 4.1% in 2024. The Congressional, the Congressional Budget Office believes it'll get up to 4.4%. Now you see this, a total of 84,638 people were laid off from U.S.-based employers in February. The report says up almost 9% from the cuts announced in the second month of 2023 and the highest February total since 2009. Guys, it's coming. I'm just telling you, I've done several videos on these, these, these layoffs. It's coming, right? It's coming. So please prepare. How do I prepare? Get you more than one stream of income. Get you more than one stream of income. That's how you prepare for this. If you only got one stream of income, guys, you're going to be vulnerable to this. You better get your secondary streams of income. That's the only way you protect yourself. You got to get additional streams, multiple streams of income coming in. Or you're going to be caught with your pants down. I'm just telling you now, it's coming. It's coming. Despite the grim February numbers, the combined job cuts for January and February were actually down 7.6% from the first two months of 23. Right? Now, you did have a pretty good January in, 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 the, um, in the labor market. Initially in January, we had 353,000 jobs added to the economy. But then they revised them down to around 290K. So, so slightly strong January, not so strong February. Let's see what March is going to do. Let's see what April is going to do. Let's see what May is going to do. And then we'll have a little bit better picture of what's going on in the labor market, right? We'll have a little bit better what's going on in the labor market, right? So here's the thing. The technology sector is responsible for the most cuts so far this year with 28,218, which makes sense. Remember we talked about these, these tech companies have figured out we don't need all y'all. We don't need all this overhead. We don't need all these, these human beings. All we want to do is, is be lean and mean. We're going to keep the best and the brightest we're going to fire the rest of y'all and we're going to bring in AI. That's what they're doing. That's what these tech companies are doing. They're only keeping the best and the brightest. And then they're going to supplement that with, with robots and, 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 and AI software and all that stuff. They, they don't need all y'all. So, so again, only way you protect yourself, I keep telling y'all, whoever pays you controls you financially. So if you, if, if you want to protect yourself, you got to get you more than you got to get multiple streams of income. I don't care what it is. It can be driving Uber at night. It can be driving Lyft. It can be it, it door dashing it. It can create your own little side hustle. Create your, your own business. You, you better do something. Have a retail strategy where you're working from home at night, selling stuff online through Etsy, through Poshmark, through uh, eBay, through Amazon. You better do something. You better do something because you do not want to be under the thumb of these giant companies. Even your mom and pop companies. And, and see, the giant companies are not the ones that are in trouble, most of them. Who are in trouble in this country are really your mom and pop businesses. And the reason mom and pop businesses are in trouble is because they can't borrow money cheap. See, mom and pop businesses has got to borrow money a lot of times just to make ends meet. They do, just to grow. I was in banking for 25 years, guys. I, I, I had a lot of mom and pop business customers. And a lot of them came to us to borrow money through lines of credit, Right. Seasonal lines of credit, year round lines of credit to buy buildings, 
to finance inventory, right? To finance receivables, all kinds of stuff. We would do it for them if they were good businesses and profitable. But they bought that money from us because they needed to to grow. At some parts of the year, they wasn't growing. They needed money in order to sustain operations until they could get into the busy season. So small businesses are the ones that are hurting the most in this country because they can't borrow money cheaply anymore. That's why it's imperative that we, we get inflation down so we can bring these interest rates down so that will give them or, or give them another source of money that they can tap into in order to grow their businesses. So, so these big boy, these big boy blue chip companies, they, they, they ain't having no problems with that. They, they, you know, a lot of them are killing it, especially in the tech sector, all right? Followed by financial firms, which cut financial firms like banks, brokerage companies, they cut about 27,000 jobs. The finance industry cut about 56% of the jobs so far this year than last while job losses in the tech industry have fallen by more than half. While the number of cuts are proportionately much lower, other sectors have been major jump, seen major jumps in job loss this year. The industrial manufacturing sector has cut about 7,900 jobs, up 1,754% from last year. Energy companies have cut 4,500 jobs, up 1,059% from last year. Education sector has had 6,400 job cuts, up 944% from last year. Companies cited restructuring as the major reason for the job loss so far this year. You notice they didn't say anything about we're not profitable. They didn't say anything about uh, we're not growing. They didn't say that. They said restructuring. You know what that's a code word for? We don't need all these employees no more. See, you notice no one said anything about, well, you know, we, we, we got to get lean and mean because we're just not profitable. We're just not growing anymore. No, they didn't say that. They said we need to restructure. And restructure just means why in the world will we be paying all these people this money when we don't need them? We don't need them. We don't need them. Let's fire some of them. Let's get them out of here. Only keep the best and the brightest. All the rest of them, we don't need this excess employee headcount. See, coming out of the pandemic, they were forced to, right? That was the initiative. Everybody got to get back to work. Let's make sure we get everybody back to work. That was the initiative coming out of the pandemic. Two years later, companies are saying, you know something? Our biggest expense is payroll. Do we really need all these people? Let's restructure as a nice way of saying we don't need you no more. We'll call it restructure. And that's what they've been doing. U.S. employers announced plans to hire 10,317 workers last month. More than 5,376 workers plan to onboard in January, but still much lower than the annual average so far. Companies had plans to hire 32,000, but they cut it back to 10, right? In January, the year's slowdown marks the smallest year-to-date total of announced hiring since 2009. Keep, guys, you know, that's the picture I'm paying for you. I'm paying that picture because you, 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 you got to understand what's happening here, right? You got to understand what's happening here. What's happening right in front of you? Do you see it? Do you see what's happening? Inflation is wobbling a little bit. It's, 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 it's at a standstill, basically. Inflation is at a standstill. And guess what? A Federal Reserve is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Right? Because over here, they got to say, we got to tighten. We got to stay tight. We got to keep interest rates higher for longer. But if they do that, they risk the chance of what? What do they risk happening if they keep it higher for longer, guys? Anybody in the chat can tell me, what does the Federal Reserve stand to lose if they keep rates higher for longer too long? What could happen to our economy, guys? Somebody in the chat, help me out here. What can happen to our economy if the Fed keeps these rates higher for longer for too long? Bingo. 
Somebody in the chat, three or four of y'all just popped in. Recession. Recession, guys. If they keep rates higher for too long, they may throw us into a recession. That's the tightening, though. On this other end, if they start easing too fast, if they start easing too soon, what happens, guys, if they start easing rates and reducing rates too fast, too soon? What can happen to the economy? What will happen? Stuck between a rock and a hard place, guys. What could happen? Inflation, right? So, so, so the Fed is in the middle here saying, okay, we got these interest rates. We're at a standstill, right? We're at a standstill. Since July of 2023, we haven't increased rates. And inflation was coming down quite nicely. But all of a sudden, we get to January of 2024, we hit a stall. Now inflation won't go down no more. It just stand there for two months. It ain't went down for two months. It's actually slightly increased. So they're saying, oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. I know, guys, we told y'all we were, you know, we had a great last year and we told y'all we were going to get ready to reduce these rates. But uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, we got to pump the brakes on that. Inflation is starting to wobble. So they're, the, 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 the soft landing that we're looking for is starting to look a little bumpy landing. You know, it ain't, it ain't a soft landing. It's, it's getting a little bit more bumpy right now. It's starting to get bumpy. That soft landing is starting to turn into a bumpy landing. I don't know, guys. I don't know what y'all see, but I'm telling you what I see. I'm seeing the soft landing that we thought we were going to get is starting to slowly turn into a bumpy landing. Not a hard landing, but a bumpy landing. Y'all know how that feels. We've all been on planes. We all know what a smooth landing feels like. We know what a bumpy landing feels like. And a lot of us know what a hard landing feels like. Right now, we're headed towards bumpy landing territory. So the Fed is saying, pump the brakes. We cannot reduce interest rates right now. We still plan on doing that. We still plan on it sometime this year. But right now is not the right time because we're not seeing the data we need to see in order to make us feel comfortable reducing rates. That's where you're at with inflation, guys. What does that mean for you and I? Well, for me at least, it means what an opportunity for me to be, keep buying my assets. Because until they reduce interest rates, they ain't going to the moon. Now we might have a jump here, we might have a jump there. S&P just hit another all-time high. That's great, but it ain't going to the moon. It's not gonna be a full-out bull market again, in my opinion, until they start reducing rates. So that gives me an opportunity as a dollar cost average guy into my favorite big boy blue chip paper assets, I'm gonna continue to buy. Now, with the exception of a few companies like NVIDIA who is still going to the moon, most of your companies in the S&P 500 are just kind of putting along. They're not losing money, not doing bad, but they're just putting along with the exception of a few companies like NVIDIA. That's an outlier. That's an exception to the rule. That's not the rule. Most companies are just surviving still. They do okay, but none of them are doing like, you know, none of them are really doing like a NVIDIA is doing. Can you imagine what a NVIDIA is going to do once we do get on this real bull run? Can you imagine if they come out with their first quarter earnings and they kill it? Can you imagine what that stock price this little 925 or whatever it closed at yesterday is a bargain, guys. Because if they come out of the first quarter with killer, killer numbers, can you imagine what that thing gonna go to? It'll probably be $1,500 per share. I, I think it'll be $1,500 per share by June. So what are you waiting on? Hey, that's all I'm saying. So, so, so my point is this. It's an opportunity for us as investors right now with this bumpy landing in play, we can buy up SPLG. It's still, it's still trading at $60 a share, guys. That's a bargain. We could still buy FTEC. Bargain. I'm buying it every day. Every day. Every day I'm buying SPLG and FTEC every day. I just bought some this morning before the live stream. I'm buying it every day. 
It's not a it's not a gazillion dollars that I'm spending, guys. What I'm doing, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm doing. My dollar cost averaging, I'm going in every month, right? Every month, dollar cost averaging. I got a certain amount of money. I'm putting 50% of that money in SPLG. I'm putting 30% of that money in FTEC. And I'm putting 20% of that money in the Magnificent Seven. So that's what I'm doing from a dollar cost averaging. Now, extra, what I'm doing extra is I'm taking money every single day. I'm taking, I don't know, maybe $100 to $300 every single day. And I'm buying SPLG and I'm buying FTEC. That's every day. I'm doing that every day the market is open, whether it's green or whether it's red. I prefer it to be red, <laughs> honestly. I prefer it to be red because remember, I got a 10-year hold pattern. I, I, I'm okay with it being red for nine of those 10 years and then go to the moon at some point before my 10 years is up. That's all I'm looking for. So the more I can buy in the red because I know I got a 10-year wait pattern, the better I'm gonna be off in 10 years. The more I can buy in the red today, the better off I'm gonna be in 10 years. The more net worth I will build. The more I can buy in the red, though. I got to buy more in the red. So I don't mind red days. Now, I don't mind green days, but I don't mind red days because I know I build more wealth in red days than I do green days. I want more green days when I get close to my 10-year window. Then I want more green days. But I prefer more red days for now. So that's what I'm doing. And then I got this reserve money that I have over here on the side. I'm waiting on Tesla. And my goal is, is if Tesla can get to $150 a share, then I'm going to dump quite a bit of money in Tesla if it can get to $150 a share. But that's, that's my, what I call my, my target buy price. And that's okay, guys. It's okay if you have a target buy price. A lot of people might say, well, you're timing the market. No, I'm not. I'm not timing the market because I'm in the market every single day, guys, 365 days a year through my dollar cost averaging. That's my primary way of investing is through dollar cost averaging. All these other little strategies I told you about, those are just secondary strategies. The primary strategy is to be in the market 365 days a year through dollar cost averaging. That's the primary strategy. The secondary strategy is buying $100 to $300 every day of SPLG and FTEC. Every single day, I buy that, that the market's open, right? And then the third strategy is I wait for big boy companies like NVIDIA and Tesla to allow me to buy in at a price I'm comfortable with. That's the third strategy. So I got three strategies I'm executing here, guys. I got three strategies I'm executing around three investments. Three strategies for three investments. Dollar cost averaging. Every single month, 50% SPLG, 30% FTEC, 20% Magnificent Seven. That's the number one primary strategy to build wealth. In the market every day, 365 days a year. Second strategy is I buy $100 to $300 worth of SPLG and FTEC every single day the market is open. And I split it down the middle 50-50. So if I'm, if I'm going to do $100, I'll put 50 and 50. If I'm going to do $300, I'll be 150-150. Right? Well, how do you do that? Guys, I got, I, got, I got, like I said, I got four brokerage accounts. Some of my brokerage accounts will allow me to do dollar cost averaging. Some of them, not dollar cost averaging, but they'll let me do fractional share trading. And some of them don't. So I find the one that will allow me to do fractional share trading on the secondary strategy. The primary strategy, I just use the Moomoo app. The secondary strategy, I may have to try something else because I need fractional share trading, which Moomoo's coming with that here shortly. So, and then the third one is, that's the, that's, that's the one, that's the home run strategy, the third strategy, right? That's me taking a, a six-figure chunk of money and putting it in Tesla, a six-figure chunk of money, and putting it in NVIDIA. Because again, I don't think NVIDIA is nowhere near where they're going to end up over the next 24 months. I think over the next 24 months, they could literally be $2,000 a share. That's what I think, if they don't split first. Either way, I'm going on the ride with them. 
through dollar cost averaging, through the Magnificent Seven, and taking a big chunk of money and putting it in them and just, and just riding it out. So those are my three strategies, guys. This is how I'm using my money in order to take advantage of this bumpy landing that we're on course to, uh, that's, that's, that's where I see us at. I see us on a bumpy landing right now. I don't see us on a soft anymore. I, I don't see us on a hard, but I do see us bumpy in the middle, right? Somewhere in the middle because you got inflation still sticky. It's being sticky. Inflation is sticky, right? You got, you got the labor uh, market slightly softening. Not crazy, not recession softening, but softening, right? We could get unemployment up to 4%. I mean, we're at 3.9 right now. So we ain't, we ain't a long ways away from 4%, guys. So that, 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 that's moving up. That's still low, but it's still, it's moving up. So it's softening. We got the Biden administration coming out with this, this, this $7.3 trillion uh, you know, budget proposal, $5.5 trillion in tax hikes. Now, he says he's going to get it from the rich. I, I doubt that. These guys pay, like he, he said in his own article, or not his article, but he was quoted as saying they only pay 8.2% in taxes. Billionaires. <laughs> I pay more taxes than them percentage-wise, not dollar-wise, percentage wise, I pay more taxes than billionaires. That's crazy to me. You pay more taxes than billionaires. Percentage wise, that's crazy to me, man. So we went through his proposal. He got some perks in there for everyday folks. But again, Congress got to bless this whole thing. So all of those won't make it to the final, the final budget. They just won't, right? All of that stuff won't make it to the final budget because the, you know, the, 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 the Congress ain't going to approve all of it. So we know that. We also talked about Americans tapping into or yanking money out of their 401ks. We talked about that. Some of you know what I'm talking about here because y'all are participating in that right now. Some of y'all are participating in this whole emergency fund. Your, your, your 401k has turned into your emergency fund thing. Some of y'all are. Some of y'all are participating in that. And, 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 and here's my solution for you. Here's my solution for you. Take an inventory of everything that you own. I mean everything. And really look at these things that you own. Really look at these things that you're spending your money on and you got to make a decision. Do I let these things go or do I keep spending money on them? That's what you got to do, guys. Because a lot of us our expenses exceed our income. That's the reason we got to go to our 401k. Our expenses exceed our income. So we're living on more than what we make. How do I correct that? I got to take an inventory of everything that I'm spending my money on and I have to let some stuff go. Got to let some stuff go, guys. If I'm driving a car... That's a, that's a big monthly payment. I got to let that go. I got I to gotta sell it. I got to sell it. I got to get out of that big old gigantic $700 a month payment, $500 a month payment. I got to let it go. I got to sell it. I have to downsize. If I'm living in a house that's taking up more than 30% of my take-home salary, when I add up everything, taxes, insurance, principal, and interest, right? When I add up taxes, insurance, principal, and interest, if that payment is more than 30% of my income that I take home, you, you, you're paying too much, guys, right? Your house rich, cash poor. You shouldn't be in that situation. If you're paying 30% or more of your income for this house, you got, you got to downsize. You got to downsize, guys. If you have a bunch of stuff, luxury stuff that you can sell online and clear all that stuff out, you know, designer clothes, designer handbags, designer shoes, luxury watches, jet skis, bass boat, um, multiple cars, taking trips. You shouldn't be doing any of that stuff if you're taking money from your 401k. You shouldn't. 
You shouldn't be doing any of that stuff if you're living paycheck to paycheck. You shouldn't be doing any of that stuff if you don't have an emergency fund. You shouldn't be doing any of that stuff if you don't have the wherewithal to do it, guys. You got to give it a get. See, see, but most people won't do that. Most people won't do that. What most people will do is say, you know something? This is how I identify myself by these things. See, I, 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 I develop my self-worth through these things. So I rather deteriorate my retirement accounts. I rather spend all my emergency fund. I rather increase all my credit card debt so that I can keep this image up so that people will believe I'm doing great. Remember, that's one of the three financial killers of financial freedom is pride. Pride is one of them. And pride is, I don't want the outside world to think I'm a failure. I don't want the outside world to think I don't have no money. I don't want the outside world to think I ain't doing well. So guess what I'm going to do internally? I'm going to suffer financially. I'm going to strip out all of my 401k. I'm going to run up every credit card I got just to prove to the outside world that I'm not struggling. That's pride. That's pride. Pride will keep you broke. Fear is another financial killer. It will keep you broke. That's how you get out of that mess, guys. See, I'm here on this channel. I'm about solutions, but it's about solutions that can get you to where you want to get to. Now, everybody ain't going to want to hear that. Again, most people get their self-worth from the things that they buy, the house that they live in, the car that they drive, the watch they wear on their wrist, the trips that they take. They rather be Instagram and Facebook rich than to be really rich. They rather appear rich on Facebook. They want to appear that they're in good shape on Facebook. Let me go take this photo like we're, oh, everything's great. When you get home, you're struggling. But we'll get on Facebook, we'll get on Instagram, we'll get on whatever little platform we want to get on to try to make people think we're doing better than we're doing. Guys, I'm telling you, you better figure out a different strategy because I'm telling you the information that I just gave you, these folks are not playing around. This, this stuff is not playing around. And if you're not prepared, if you're not insulated, you're going to get run over. Like an 18-wheeler runs over a little bug out in the road. You're going to get ran over just like that. Multiple streams of income is number one. Always have multiple streams of income. I don't, I, develop something. You're smart. You're capable. See, a lot of us, though, we think we're too good to do some of these side hustles. We think we're too good to drive DoorDash. We think we're too good to drive Lyft or Uber. We think we're too good to do an online business online where we're buying and selling stuff. We think we're too good for that. I'm too educated for that. Stay broke. It's your choice. You can go ahead and depend on that education. You can depend on anything you want to depend on. But if those people fire you, and you ain't got some protection behind yourself, which is assets that generate income, you're going to be in a world of trouble. You're going to be in a world of trouble. So please, guys, take heed. Get yourself financially in shape. Get yourself ready to go. Understand that there are two economies, boom economy, bust economy, right? Right? If you're living paycheck to paycheck and all this other stuff I talked about, you're down here in this bust economy. So you're, you're feeling the pain. You're feeling financial pain right now. That's the people who are dipping into their 401ks. That's the people who are still running up credit card debt. If they got balances to run, if they got limits to run up, they're still running them up. Those are the people who are living paycheck to paycheck. They're down here in this, in this bust economy. Why? Because they don't have access to loans and they don't have no personal savings. They just have their wages. And those wages could be affected. But the people up here in this boom economy is different because they have assets. They have multiple streams of income. If you don't believe me, guys, go check it out for yourself. You, you, I saw a report where 
most millionaires, right? Most millionaires have multiple streams of income. Most millionaires in the United States, when you sit down with them on average, they have multiple streams of income. Why do they do that? It's protection. It's protection, right? They know their most valuable resource is their time. Their most valuable resource is their time. So they use that time to do what? Build out multiple streams of income. And then what do they get to do? Then they get to control all of their time. I've built these multiple streams of income out here that take care of me. And then I can take my time and go do the things that I really want to do that matter to me in this life. And I ain't got to worry about money. That's what most millionaires do. They build multiple streams of income. So if I'm not a millionaire and I aspire to be a millionaire, I aspire to be at financial freedom, what should I be doing? Building multiple streams of income. One of those streams of income is assets. They do. So all I'm telling you guys is create your own plan. Do nothing. Some of y'all ain't going to do nothing and that's okay. Don't do anything. Just, just go ahead and stay where you're at. One thing I'll guarantee you, though, for those of y'all that are not going to do anything, whatever you got in 2023, your results, whatever your results were in 2023, if you want the same results in 2024, just do the same thing you did in 23. I guarantee you, you'll get the same results. So if you did nothing, you're a couch potato and you spend all your time pleasuring yourself. You spend all your time uh, entertaining yourself. You spend all your time making the 1% wealthy. You spend all of your time in the matrix. Just do that again in 2024. You'll get the same results. I promise you. That's a promise. I guarantee it. Now, for those of you that say, no, I don't want to do what I did in 23 because I didn't get the results that I wanted in 23. What do I need to do, Richard, in 24? Change your activities. If the activities you did in 23 didn't get you the results you were looking for in 23, change your activities in 2024. Five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, I just ran you through the blueprint to double my net worth over the next year. I just ran it through. I just gave you every, every investment that I'm buying and when I'm buying them. And I just gave it to you. I just gave it to you. So, so if you want to change results, I, I mean, change activities. Pretty simple. If I want results to be different, then my activities got to be different. Sit down, write down your activities. What have you done today to get you one step closer to your financial freedom? Tell me that. What have you done today? What time is it? I don't even know what time it is. What is it, close to 12 o'clock p.m. Uh, Eastern time? That's half of a day. What have you done? Oh, I ain't done nothing. I just had my coffee and, 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 and strolled through Instagram for three hours to, to, to laugh and have a good time before I go to work. See, that's not, that's not an activity that's going to put no money in your pocket. See, see, strolling through Instagram on your way to work or while you're at work or while you're on the toilet. See here, man, that ain't going to build you no well. Mm -mm. You better figure out some activities that actually create wealth. You better put some activities in your daily routine that actually create wealth. Oh, I work all day long. I do nothing but work all day long. Nobody works 24 hours a day. We can use that excuse if we want to. Nobody works 24 hours a day. I don't know nobody that works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know one soul that does that. Now, there may be one outlier out there that does that, but that's not, that's an exception. That's not the rule. My point is we all have downtime. The difference between people that get to financial freedom and become millionaires and control 100% of their time is what they do in their downtime. That's the difference. What do you do in your downtime when you're not working? at your primary occupation. What are you doing with that time after that? What do you do? I don't know, only you can answer that question. But whatever you're doing, if it's not giving you the results you're looking for, you better change what you're doing. One recommendation is stop being a consumer and start being a producer.
See, producers earn money in their downtime. That's being a producer. If you're a consumer in your downtime, then that's an activity you want to change. Because that activity is going to keep you broke. Just telling you guys. This is the, car, the, the cold, hard facts. You can listen to them. You don't have to listen to them. I done been there. I've been there and done that. I had to change everything in my financial life in order to get where I'm at today. I mean everything. And I'm so glad I did. Again, guys, watch out for all these nutcase scammers in here. I'm telling you. See, I can tell you one thing about these scammers. Dumb joke is always producing. These scammers, they always produce it. They don't take no days off. See, y'all around here, oh, I need days off. These scammers, man, <laughs> whether, they're on, whether they're in the chat, whether they're in the, the comment section, whether they're on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, it don't matter, boy, these scammers don't take no days off. None. They are true to their, their scamming. They don't take no days off. Dumb joke is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, they scam you. You, 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 got them, you got to applaud them for their work ethic. They got one of the best work ethic, ethics I've ever seen. One of the best work ethics I've ever seen. These dang on scammers, man. These guys and gals don't quit. I mean, I don't care. Boy, they ain't gonna be on. You can can't. You can you can report a hundred of them, and a thousand of them will pop up. It's just crazy. So be careful out there, guys. Be careful. Don't look for shortcuts. That's when you open yourself up to scammers. They prey on people that look for shortcuts. They prey on people who want somebody else to take control of their own financial freedom. Oh, I. I don't know nothing about stocks, but if, you, if I give you this thousand dollars, can you can you get, make me rich? They prey on that. They prey on people who want shortcuts. They prey on people who who who, who don't want to take their own control of their own financial freedom. They pay on, prey on people like that, man. So 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 don't take shortcuts. Take on your own ownership of your financial freedom. Don't send money to people to invest for you. Invest for yourself. All you got to do is go down to the description box, click on that Moomoo link, open up your Moomoo account, put some money in it, start investing for yourself. Build wealth for yourself. Why do I got to send a thousand dollars to some joker online to do that for me? When nine out of ten times it's a scammer. No legitimate investment advisor going to slide into your DMs. Not, not, I, they better not slide into mine. Because that tells me all I need to know about you as an investment banker or investment, uh, 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 whatever you are. Don't be sliding in my DM. That ain't, uh-uh. I don't want nobody sliding in my DM that I'm finna send any money to invest for me. It's, it's ridiculous. Invest for yourself. That's all you got to do. One of my strategies, I take $100, $300 a day and I invest for myself in two things. That's it. I don't want to invest in nothing else but those two things. S&P 500, information technology ETF. Those two things. Every day, one to $300 a day. Boom. Every day the market open. That's all I do. This is not, this is not a lot of money. Uh, no. But, but, but you know something? That one to $300 over the next 10 years, I do that every single day the market is open. Who got a financial calculator and, and, and can add that up for me? Somebody add up, somebody add up, let's take an average of $200 a day. Every day the market's open now. So what is that, about 200 days a year? 200, 220 days a year? So somebody take 200 days a year times 200 and then, then tack an 8% rate of return on that for the next 10 years and tell me how much money I got. Somebody in the chat who got a financial calculator, run that for me. Run that two hundred dollars a day. That two hundred dollars a day times what? Let's just say two hundred days a year that the that the uh, market is open. Now nah, it's more than thirty-two thousand because you're talking about two hundred dollars a day times two hundred is is what? What's two hundred dollars a day times two hundred? 
Uh, Y'all gonna make me turn my calculator back on. Thirty-two thousand ain't right. Let me turn my let me let me turn my cap, my phone back on. Hopefully, it don't mess up the live, cause I can't get nobody to do that for me. Let me let me run this myself. And let's see what that ends up. But but you gotta you gotta tack the eighty the eight percent rate of return on it too, guys. You can't just do. You got to tack the eighty percent rate of return on it, the eight percent rate of return on it as well. It can't just be. Let's see here. Let me find my financial calculator. So I'm doing two hundred dollars a day times two hundred. Hell, that's forty thousand dollars in one year. So I don't know what 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 y'all talking about. That's forty thousand dollars in one year. But but now you got to take that forty thousand dollars a year. And then you got to put an eight percent rate of return on it for 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 ten years. There we go. That's more like it. Three hundred and fifty-two thousand dollars. Yeah, that's more like it. That's more like it. That's more like it. No, it's it's actually more than that. It's way more than that. You're talking about forty thousand dollars a year, guys. Right. $200 a day times 200 days. That's $40,000 in one year times 8% rate of return for 10 years. Yeah, it's about $625,000. So, so who wouldn't take that? Who wouldn't take that, guys? Who wouldn't take $600,000 in 10 years by investing $200 a day? $200 a day. I'm trying to tell y'all guys, I'm doing that right now. I'm doing at least one to $300 a day. I'm gonna say average of $200 a day. So that's $40,000 a year times 10 times eight. Well, $40,000 a year times eight times 10. Now you gotta compound it. I don't have my financial calculator to go. <laughs> this joke is talking about 1 billion. <laughs> y'all stupid, man. Some of y'all are just crazy. He talking about one billion. <laughs> I wish it was one billion. I'd be a fat rat right now. But yeah, my point is, it'll be over six hundred thousand dollars, guys. So I'm gonna do two hundred. I'm gonna do one to three hundred dollars a day. Every day the market's open. Let's just say two hundred dollars a day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Two hundred days a year, and I'm gonna do that for the next ten years. Right there alone, guys, that's one of my strategies. That's 600K. Not even include my dollar cost averaging strategy that I'm doing once a month. Not including my third strategy where I'm going to take six figures and put it into, you know, NVIDIA and Tesla. Just think about the wealth that I'm going to build by my strategy, just doing and staying consistent, staying disciplined, being patient for the next 10 years, the wealth that I'm going to build. That's why I keep telling y'all guys, you don't need to know a lot about the stock market. You ain't got to be fancy. You don't have to know a lot. You just got to be disciplined, consistent, and patient, and you will build wealth. Well, guys, I appreciate you. Lock it in with a thumbs up. We're getting ready to get on out of here. Hopefully, uh, we, we got better reception today on the live stream. If, uh, yesterday was, 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 was a, a collapse. It was a failure yesterday. I left the video up, but it was really, really bad. Uh, quality wise. I don't know what happened to my internet, but it was terrible. But today, hopefully we, we, we got a better, better live stream. I'm going to work on my internet game. I'm going to get that proper and get it right. So I don't have these problems going forward, but it's going to take me a minute to do it. I'm going to get that better. I am going to commit to continue to get better for you guys delivering this information. I'm going to step my game up. I'm going to buy some additional equipment. Because if I'm going to be doing these live streams, I got to get, get my game up. When I'm just doing the regular videos on my phone and, and I edit them in a 10 minutes, don't matter, right? Because I'm going to have great quality because I'm, it, it, it's not live streaming. When you're live streaming, you, you can't mess around. You got to have better quality stuff and you got to make sure you got that connection and it's sharp and it's strong. And, and I dropped the ball on that. So I'm going to work on that. But I appreciate you guys rocking with me. Go ahead and hit that like button before you get out of here just to let me know that the information that I delivered today was information that, that could be helpful to you, right? You don't have to agree with all of it. I wasn't picking sides when I was talking about the Republicans and the Democrats, so don't, don't go haywire on me. I wasn't picking sides. I was just giving you information. 
That's it. You do decide what you want to do with that information. But lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here if you appreciate the content. If you appreciate me stepping up every day, making these lives, making my edited content just to keep you guys informed, trying to give you golden nuggets to get to your wealth. Just gave you again what I'm doing. So I'm trying to be transparent, telling y'all exactly how I'm investing, exactly what I'm investing in so that you know how I'm building wealth. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much for rocking with me today. Hit that thumbs up before you get out of here just to let me know you're rocking with me. Also, if you want 15 free stocks or up to 15 free stocks, guys, go down to the description box and click on that Moomoo link. That's the brokerage app that I'm going to be using this year to double my net worth over the next 10 years, right? So if you want to rock with me, you want a good brokerage app to use, it's easy to use. They don't charge you any fees to use it. Um, it's, it and like I said, they got great in-app tutorials to show you how to use the app. To, to, to teach you about stocks, to teach you about ETFs. If you want to options trade, they'll teach you. you got some good information on that. It's just a wealth of information in that Moomoo brokerage app from a tutorial and courses standpoint. All you got to do, sign up, put you some money in it, go down to where it says discover in the bottom right corner, go to discover. And then when you get to the next page, just click on learning. You click on learning and then boom, it's going to open up all these tutorials and all this additional information that you can learn how to become a better investor. You ain't trying to be an expert. You're just trying to know enough to be able to feel comfortable buying these assets and using their app. I recommend you do that. I even go into that tutorial from time to time to check it out, to see things, even though I'm a seasoned vet at this and I know what I'm buying. I know I'm not doing no options trading. I know I'm not doing anything in Hong Kong or anywhere else. All I want to do is buy the big three, right? I just want to buy them three big boy blue chip assets to build wealth. And I just walk you through what those three are. So if you want to rock with me, get down to that description box, open up that Moomoo account, put you some money in it, get up to 15 free stocks, and then send me an email and say, hey, Richard. I want to copy your plan. Send me that video that outlines those three big boy blue chip paper assets you're going to buy over the next 10 years to double your net worth. I just gave you a little slice of it. 600K, guys. Matter of fact, about 650K over 10 years off of a $200 investment per day. It's going to grow to over 650K in 10 years. Wow. That'll be a nice little nest egg to go to the Caribbean, buy me a little piece of land right on the Caribbean ocean, white sand, blue water, blue skies, sunshine. <whistles> that 600K gonna come in handy to buy that little piece of property, man, in the golden years. So whatever you're trying to get accomplished, investing, guys, in the right assets can get you there. But you gotta pull the trigger. You gotta get yourself off the sideline and put yourself in the game. If you're willing to do that, you can have anything you want in this life. You can have anything you want in this life. We well, appreciate you guys. Thoughts become things. If you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy, get wealthy, and I'm going to catch you on the next video. Peace.